Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day um, of the standing committee. Trust uh, we all had a good rest yesterday. Uh, so welcome to this capacity building workshop on conducting a feasibility study on cross-border paperless trade, where we will look at framework and case studies. Uh, my name is Yun Fai Li from the Secretariat and I will briefly introduce the program for this morning and moderate the first part of the session. For today's workshop, we will look at how feasibility studies can be conducted in countries and utilized to identify opportunities for cross-border paperless trade with an aim of moving towards pilot projects and eventual implementation. So to give some background, we have two ongoing feasibility study projects in ASCAP involving uh, two of our speakers this morning, uh, Mr. Dennis Pantastico and Ms. Carrie Ahn. For the first project, um, a framework that can be used to conduct a feasibility study was developed by Dennis, and that is being used uh, right now in an ongoing study for the Philippines. And for the second project involving Carrie, uh, that has more of a focus on data harmonization and exchange mechanisms, and for the framework used for that project, a uh, part of it is in common with Dennis's uh, uh, document, what he has developed. And then there are also sections uh, that have been developed by Kerry, focusing on data harmonization and exchange and emerging technologies. And for that project, uh, there are ongoing studies in Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, and Timor-Leste. So the workshop is split into two parts with the first part right now, uh, focusing on the framework and how it can be used to conduct feasibility studies. And in part two, we will look at interim findings from the ongoing studies and share some experiences and lessons for implementation of cross-border electronic exchange. Um, so I will now uh, invite Dennis uh, to present his part. And just a note that we will take questions at the end after both Dennis and Kerry have presented. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yern Fai, and good morning to everyone. So happy to share a more structured uh, framework um, in, in compliance with uh, the CBPT, CPTA. So just allow me to introduce myself maybe just for a few seconds. So I used to be with the uh, ASEAN Secretariat. I, I was part of the ASEAN Single Window, and also I was involved with with risk management, um, technical platforms, and also I'm doing uh, the integrated risk management and also the AEO program for the Philippines. And also I'm supporting the, the ASEAN single window um, policy implementation at the national level. So more on direct member state support. So next slide, please. So just the overview. Uh, sections is covering methodology and how we crafted, how I designed a questionnaire and also specific questionnaire, both for the high level National Trade Facilitation Council and how we can improve or harmonize some of the indicated cross-border uh, electronic messages and also the benefits and costs involved. Next slide, please. Oh, so I, I think it's with me. So these are the objectives, specific documents, partner countries, what processes and what systems should be improved, and also the benefits. So in, in mapping or in crafting the, the questionnaires that we provided, uh, I designed this more on the end-to-end -end cargo clearance process, starting from the exporting country, uh, from pre-departure, and then the involvement of um, regulatory agencies, the movement of the goods from the manufacturing side up to the, if there will be a consolidator involved, up to the transport to the customs area, and then the key uh, procedures under customs, you have the submission, selectivity or risk management, assessment, payment, and also release. And then after the release, the link 
with the port operators, with the port community actors, and then the closure processes, what to do with that particular transaction. So we map this, the whole end-to-end -end cargo clearance from uh, export up to the delivery of the, the goods to the importer's premises. And this, um, we look into this because we know that um, and to end cargo clearance process is multidimensional. So you look at different dimensions, wherein for every actor involved, for every entity involved, they look at the same document, but the treatment is different. That's why when we, when we design this questionnaire, when you get all the specific uh, answers in relation to the procedures or processes and the actual exchange, the intent is really to convert this in what we call under a digital data governance uh, process, wherein you can convert this to business rules and information rules, so that the exchange, the interagency sharing information would be more systematic. And I think this is also in line with what, what our high level experts uh, conveyed yesterday, wherein cargo clearance is not static, so you have to follow through at the national level. It's not just a simple cross-border exchange wherein you just make it electronic. There should be a follow through. For example, the e FITO, it doesn't directly go to customs. It should go to the Department of Agriculture first. And then when they validate it, they process and they issue the import permit, which is the requirement of the customs authority to proceed with the declaration. So in, we're looking at five actors or entities involved. So I came up with two versions. One is the shorter version involving only the government agencies. So trade regulatory agencies or border regulatory agency customs and also the steering committee or the high level council in decision making or governance. And for the Philippines, um, since um, they requested me to also include the economic operators, the private sector. So we also included as part of the questionnaire, the trading community and also the port community or the logistics actors. So if you're interested also to, to get the questionnaire, both for the trading community and the freight forwarder, I already provided it to UNESCO. So as conveyed earlier, cargo clearance is multidimensional. You have to really look into the different um, mandates and also different uh, functionalities of all the involved stakeholders. And as a direct beneficiary, I think the ultimate one should be the SMEs. And also as conveyed yesterday, we have to leverage on the use of modern technology and uh, customs is the key decision maker here. I think everyone agrees. With. So, but it should be supported by the different border regulatory agencies. And we know the, the mandate of custom is strike a balance between uh, among enforcement, trade facilitation and revenue generation. They have to balance this and they could not, uh, customs should not just focus on one particular mandate. So that is the intent. That's why if you look at the RKC, the revised Kyoto Convention, they created this post-entry audit group just to expedite the facilitation. And then you run after the enforcement. You can do it after post-release. So we look at five targeted at least 15 border regulatory agencies, because for a particular broker that is only familiar with the importation or exportation of electronic goods might have a different answer. If compared to a broker that is only familiar with, let's say food or exportation of import and food. And also uh, at least 15, 15 questionnaires were also provided for the exporter, importer, and customs broker. And just one for customs, 
in logistics or the port community and also the national trade facilitation committee so the same um, intent that's why we're giving at least five respondents for the exporter importer and broker because they have different uh, competencies in relation to in the filing of particular commodities So the, the intent is really mapping this to find, to find out the degree of digitalization per actor involved, per procedure, per processes. And we have to distinguish also this activity from the initial CBPT readiness assessment. So since we're looking at, at different uh, functionalities and also uh, this one is more structured and the, the, the questionnaire was also uh, includes best practices. Each questionnaire is structured into two different sections. Initially, export and also import regimes. So of course we can also include the transit, but the other regimes, we can do that maybe in, in a later stage. Let's say warehousing, temporary admission, um, declaration under bond, transshipment, trans, uh, transshipment, or any international uh, transit or transshipment. So just describing the whole export and in re import regime process, starting from the ordering goods and then agreeing on shipping inco terms the movement of goods obtaining letter LC, and then issuance of the business documents, freight papers, arranging, booking of, a booking of freight, processing bill of lading, and so on. I think everyone's familiar with the end-to-end -end cargo clearance process. So the, the survey matrix, um, is described below. There's just a sequential order, the number of questions. I think uh, everyone got this sample questionnaire, wherein under column number four, self-assessment score from one to five, five means fully digitized, and one is just manual process. And then column five is just to elaborate on the status, and column six is just to provide your suggestion, in possible improvement, and if there are initiatives, you can just indicate it in column six. So feel free to intervene if you want to raise questions. I think I have 20 minutes to do this. And then just the uh, target partner countries, just to provide uh, as part of the questionnaire under section C. And then initially, I provided some of the crossword documents that could be improved and harmonized, just for reference. Of course, we have the commercial documents, the airway, house airway bill, outward, inward manifest, and also pre-arrival information of the carrier, just to know where to position it so the port operator could, would be ready in relation to the aircraft or the sea craft, the identification number, ETA, estimated time of arrival. Then of course you have the expert declaration, CO, phyto, animal health, food safety, and other permits, laboratory exams. If you want to include also unstructured information such as um, intelligence tips or for advanced ruling, you can also include all those things. And this is the, on how we analyze now the completed cost questionnaire. So we will do this horizontally, wherein we can average the scores of at least 3.0 and below 5.0, and that would be subject to improvement and also maybe harmonization. And then, you can do also this research just to further explain some of the answers that you got.
and for section E is just the cost and benefits. So this is a straightforward question. So as I conveyed earlier, end-to-end um, uh, -end cargo clearance is multidimensional. So what we did in the Philippines is everything should be driven by business and information rules, where in, in the middle, you can see safety and security, that's information security, reference data sets. So what would be the commonality? And we know that we have to recognize or determine some of the, the primary key data elements in so that it would be easier for you to cross-reference or cross-validate. Any available information that you get depending on the procedures at what point. And then you have the legal framework and digital data governance. And also, if it's possible, you can also include in your NSW or any other platform to transform, transform convert, transliterate any type of documents. You can also include dashboards. So if you look at the top, those are the key enablers, plat platform enable enablers. On the left side, that is the port community. On the lower side, it's the trading community and all the key government um, agencies. You have the border regulatory agencies and, of course, customs. And then at the right side, you have the financial industry and also statistical authority if you want to implement, let's say, a full full feature data warehousing system so that you can have what we call the single source of truth principle. So if you want to link this into a higher level, let's say risk management, integrated risk management, you want to link this with your trusted partnership program, you can use all the data, the transactional data that you get and link it with your data warehousing system. So also, um, if you look at the top middle, we, we included also the trade repository portal here because um, in, our, in the trade repository portal, per HS code, you can determine the number of licenses and permits that you need just to support an import declaration. Let's say you have agency one, agency two, agency three, so that it would be easier, let's say for your NSW portal to execute what we call the completeness check routine. So you can do a first pass validation for your NSW once you receive the cross-border documents and then the system will just tell you that um, you have to complete all the supporting documents before you can submit it to customs. So that is the intent of the trade repository repository portal in the middle, linking the NSW and also the rep repository portal. The left side is purely government to government exchange, cross-border and also, um, and then at the right side is the B2B, business to business exchange. So this is just the information data flow for customs perspective. You can include also a diagram or a data flow for other perspective. Let's say for the port community, for the NTFC, for the different border regulatory agencies in relation to cross-border paperless trade and also the follow-up procedures at the national level. So as I conveyed earlier, cross-border or end-to-end -end cargo clearance is not static. You really have to provide some analysis at the national level. And you can cross-validate, cross-reference, everything. So I got here um, four principles. There are nine just to support your uh, report in completing the, the analysis per country. So we're looking at also, I provided the concept of master data management. This is 
setting up uniform set of information rules, sort of a high, high level technical reference modeling, or if you want to call it minimum config configuration model. And the result of this, you determine the primary key data elements, and you can come up with a very systematic data governance council decided by, by the heads of the agencies and driven by business rules or information rules. So another one is information security policy, your asset and also your applications. Third, in line with what was discussed yesterday, third is more on identity management. Fourth is the enabling platform. You have the NSW, you have the routing management platform, we, which we see as a technology technology neutral platform, which is supposed to be not owned and managed by a regulatory agency, but should be managed by a neutral agency so that the rules would not be in favor with, with that particular uh, agency managing the day-to-day -day operation. Modular approach is just similar to plug and play, wherein when you design an application, it should be expandable, scalable, extensible, so that you retain the investment, you just continuously improve it. Digital data governance is more on the high level uh, rules that should be discussed, deliberated by the National Trade Facilitation Council in relation to the role-based access of different users. Partnerships, this could also be MRA, both at the cross-border level and then maybe service level agreement at the national level. Outreach, and of course, number nine is sustainability. So that ends my presentation. So feel free to raise some of your clarifications or comments. Uh, thank you. Very hand Sure. Yep. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Sorry, I, I mentioned just now uh, that we take questions at the end, but given the, the number of slides and the amount of content, uh, we'll take quick questions now. So uh, we open the floor for any questions and online as well. Han, do we have um, Zoom questions? No, for now, Han. Okay. Um, in that case, since we have quite a packed program, uh, may I invite Carrie now to give her presentation? Thank you. Thank you, Yonte. Okay, so good morning, distinguished delegators. Uh, I'm Kerry Yang. So I'm working on a feasibility study on cross-border electronic exchange of trade data. So co-working with SCAB and also Taxing. So in this time, I will explain the framework of the feasibility study report used in, in this project. This is the content of today's presentation. So first, I will briefly explain the overview of the feasibility study. Next, I will explain the content of the feasibility study doing now. Lastly, I will explain the way forward to finalize this feasibility study as a conclusion. So this the feasibility study is the has been uh, ha, uh, has been starting since the end of July this year. This project is to enhance the perspective for sustainable cross-border trade digitalization through the application of emerging technologies and to strengthen the capacity of target countries in facilitating cross-border paperless trade for sustainable development development and utilizing emerging technologies when feasible and effective. 
sorry, to do this, I prepared the pre uh, feasible study report framework for cross-border electronic document exchange in four countries by comparing and analyzing other similar feasible study report the release by the EDCF, World Bank, or IMO, the as well as the ESCA. This the feasibility study framework is the intended to guide the user in evaluating the feasibility of the selected country, the engaging in the cross-border electronic exchange of trade-related data and document with the partner countries. In addition, it is focused on identifying feasible trade documents, the including data elements and data exchange mechanisms for initiating the cross-border electronic exchange of trade data. So from these slides, I will explain the outlines of the feasibility study framework. So as I mentioned in previous slide, I prepared this uh, feasibility study report for by the uh, by comparing and analyzing other similar feasibility study reports, and take some part of the so then is the framework report. So this feasibility study report is composed of five sections and five annex. Uh, annex. So this feasibility study report framework outlines the feasibility study project overview, the current situation of the target country, the current status of, of work process, and the future model. The first section is the objective and description of the feasibility study. Second part is the analysis of the status that analyze the current status of the country related to the cross-border electronic exchange of data, the including legal environment, trade procedure, especially with the neighboring and major trading partner countries, and ICT infrastructure. It also briefly identifies the main challenges and key issues, as well as the requirement and needs for the to be model, which will be addressed in section three. For collecting, so collecting pri uh, primary information, the national expert has conducted interviews and circulated questionnaire with the government agency and relevant stakeholders using Annex A and B. So especially, the, I the briefly the introduce the detail of the Section 2. The Section 2.3 is relating to trade procedure and volume. So the main export product and main export country in their country in the in four countries using a workflow of export procedure for main export product and status of information as example are uh, described in this section. So this slide shows the workflow in case of export procedures. National export has drawn their flow charts for each country's trade procedures like this. The third section is a recommendation that describes the current level of the corresponding country in the paper trade matrix level and what to do for the next step regarding the context for undertaking the proposed feasibility study. So next we will suggest the draft the to be model of cross border paper trade and transit for each country. And this part contains the system computerization to provide a detailed analysis of the technical requirement to deliver the, to deliver the proposed solution. So next is uh, maybe the section four. Section four is the expected effects through the feasibility study that summarize the key finding and the expected effects of the feasibility study and future model, future plans as a conclusion. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so regarding the annex, so annex A is a questionnaire for the feasibility studies on the cross-border electronic data exchange of trade data. And annex A is composed of the four parts. Part one is a policy and regulation. Part two is work and operation aspect. Part three is a technical aspect. And the part four is the others, others is matter. 
National consultant will the already circulate this the questionnaire to their country's corresponding organization or within their organizations and collect it. After that, they summarize the result of the questionnaire in section two. The Annex B is to assess what specific data or document should be used for cross-border electronic exchange. This Annex is adapted from Section B of the Framework of Conducting National Feasibility Study on the Cross-Border Electronic Exchange of Trade-Related Data or Documents. Annex B contains the several surveys, so which need to be selected based on the respondent, respondent organization. If the uh, responder is working in customs, then they should the, fill out the custom authority survey on cross-border paper trade of Annex B. Annex C is the trade information that collect trade information such as main goods, main partners, and trade volume, et cetera, for export and import, export and import process from data released by an international organization. National consultant will be reference this information on filling out section two and they update it if, the, uh, if necessary. Annex D is a template for initiating cross-border electronic data exchange. Uh, this initial template was developed by UN Next Task Force on cross-border electronic data exchange, Northeast Asia, and submit to the LTWG as a contribution. So, when a task force will be established and discuss details for cross-border data exchange, they will utilize it and can describe the, uh, the required information. In addition, this template is more useful in developing data elements required for cross-border electronic data exchange and technical matter. Annex E is to assess the cost and benefit of improving and harmonizing the system and processes the necessary. This annex also the adapt from section D of the framework of conducting national feasibility study on the cross-border electronic exchange of trade related data or documents. So national consultant also should prepare the draft of the section four, the based on the annex E. So we talk about the what to do after analysis of the current status. After, an after analysis of the current status, we need to discuss proper goods for cross-border electronic document exchange with the neighboring countries. Then it will extract common items and they will discuss what kind of data elements will be exchanged among common items. The selected goods among the major goods may be exchanged at the pilot project of electronic document for cross-border paper trade and transit in the next phase. So when I reviewed the major goods of the draft of the section two made by for countries national export, I found some goods such as appliance, clothes, and agriculture product as a common goods. But this, it is just my understanding, so it is better uh, it will select the proper goods by discussing that after, after the completion of section two. So in conclusion, talking about what is the consideration for cross-border electronic data exchange of trade data for connectivity, interoperability, reliability, and safety. The participating country need to consider which organization will partic uh, participate in the pilot stage of the cross-border electronic document exchange project and how to select one or two goods among the major goods of participating countries. After analyzing the major goods, all members of the PW study or task force team will select target document for the selected goods. In addition, the following knowledge is required through SCAP capacity building workshop. First is a business process re-engineering, the concept, basic concept of business process re-engineering. Second is the framework agreement on facilitation of cross-border paper trade in Asia and the Pacific. So yesterday we also discussed about the framework agreement. Last one is, is 
is the SQL business process analysis guide and data harmonization guide for data harmonization. Because the, when the exchange electronic data the, among the participant country, it's important to the unify, the exchange, the unify, unified and the simplified data element. That's why I suggest to the, this, the two capacity building, what the, 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 this the, the information is very important. So I the request to the people starting the pilot stage, it is the important to the understanding the what is the what is the need, what is the required for data harmonization. So in addition, I suggest the following way for the required in the pilot stage. The participating countries in the pilot phase must understand the purpose, goals, and the necessity of electronic data exchange for cross border paper trade and must mutually agree to exchange electronic documents and data for interoperability before the pilot stage. The second thing is task force team in the pilot stage should include person in charge of domain expert and IT expert for each country and requires SCAP capacity building workshop to enhance the participating country's capability. So I will also the explain the interim result of this project in part two. So I also the would like to appreciate the four countries' fruitful effort to conduct this, this project. So with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, now uh, we open to the floor and to Zoom online uh, chat questions as well. Please feel free to ask uh, any questions. Okay, so I had the, the one suggestion to the Taksin. So Taksin is always a talk about the cyber security. So I think it's a, the, I the, suggest to the Taksin to the explain why we, the cyber security important to the cross-border data exchange. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, and thanks to Dennis and Kerry that uh, uh, you have uh, 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 very carefully integrated the, the subject in your format uh, as we discussed earlier. So really, it uh, addresses the sentiment. But uh, but Kerry uh, talks about the necessity and need for um, uh, cyber security in uh, our work program especially with respect to uh, the feasibility study and subsequent uh, steps. Uh, as we uh, do uh, move from paper to paperless environment, uh, everything uh, rests uh, on a, uh, on a um, data center and uh, makes use of the communication protocols and lines uh, to transact the business. The more and more uh, automation, more and more threats to the data privacy, and uh, uh, more uh, challenges for you to carefully identify that with whom you are transacting electronically, whether he's the one with whom who you intend to transact the business. Uh, in paper-based environment, which is happening for centuries, that we are comfortable that there is a signature and seal. Mm, that gives me the level of confidence and uh, also the uh, level of confidence in the sense that uh, it will be uh, uh, used as uh, uh, in the court of law as an evidence. But uh, this uh, uh, standing scrutiny as evidence is a challenge for, for both, for, for the legal uh, paternity as well as for uh, those who are transacting the business the, when the, there is a dispute. So there is a need for us to address few things. Number one, I am able to very closely identify uh, uh, the, the, to whom we are transacting the business on a network is the one who is supposed to be the recipient. So how 
digitally you identify a, 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 a committee com partner sitting on the other side in another jurisdiction. When you, I'm saying other jurisdiction, then there is a need for us to also understand and appreciate that between the two nations, there is the mutual understanding and uh, acceptability that uh, an electronic document will have the same validity in court of law as that of uh, 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 the paper-based document, number one. And number two, that if there is a dispute, it will be resolved between both the countries because there is an agreement between both the countries that we will accept the electronic document. So the so first is that you have to ensure that there is a, a clear understanding about how you identify someone. Uh, so or digital identity uh, management is a big issue. There has been initiative, you must have seen yesterday in the forenoon, there was a presentation where we have talked about uh, verifiable credentials and uh, uh, also we have distributed identity uh, management. So these are the subjects which there are standards for it. And when we try to do uh, uh, this activity, we have to uh, understand that we have one such uh, aspects up and running in your jurisdiction in your country. So that is something which need to be addressed very well. And also safeguard the interest that the the data and the document which is stored on a computer, not only that it will be seen today, but it will be seen with response to uh, 10 uh, years or 20 years or 50 years down the line, that what you have stored on the computer can be verified after 10, 15 years when the technology changes. So these are the challenges that perhaps we'll have to uh, take into account. It takes time to uh, uh, build it into your legal framework and that something should be taken care of parallelly. Uh, uh, digital uh, security and data document retention is a very important subject. And I know that this has been built into both, both the uh, documents, but you need to also underline and understand that this is a necessity and should be integrated into your legal framework. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tassin, uh, for the sharing. Uh, we have a question from Zoom. And actually, Tassin has touched a bit on um, this question uh, from, from Zoom. So um, this question is asking, should we be aware of certain issues related to uh, resilient digital trade facilitation, uh, things such as internal threat signals or threat intelligence. So some of the related topics uh, to invite some of the speakers to talk about uh, could be visibility of both external and internal attack surfaces, monitoring for baseline deviations for detecting insider threats, uh, interrupting of communications, for example, in uh, e-commerce or payment or data exfiltration, and the leveraging of network data for security, uh, visibility, and control. So I, I think Tassin has uh, touched on some of that, but perhaps uh, Dennis uh, might want to speak on this. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, since this touches more on a, a secure pipeline, so I think I can convey on, uh, two important factors. One is identity management to ensure that the sending actor and the receiving actor are both uh, authorized and um, accredited. And then second, of course, is digital signature, just to ensure wherein if you transmit a particular electronic document, you are more comfortable that you provide information security issues. And based on international best practices, I covered one is information security policy, which could be under ISO 27001 up to 27005. And then ISO 3100 under risk management covering the whole procedures and processes just for accountability for each particular actor. And in relation to e-commerce payment or um, just for electronic payment, uh, just to cite what the Philippines uh, did for electronic payment, just to provide complete visibility, is the Philippines now implementing what we call auto debiting. So there is a secure pipeline between the authorized agent banks and also customs 
and also some TRGAs, not, not very limited TRGAs. So you just assign under the export or import declaration the bank account and also the bank code. And there is an escrow account under that particular trader or actor wherein automatically the customs can transmit the accounts payable directly to the bank. Without human intervention, it goes to the account of that person automatically, instantaneously, the, the bank will debit, uh, credit, credit the payment for duties and taxes or for a transaction fee. And then it will provide an electronic notification to the Bureau of Customs, what Bureau of Customs receives it, and automatically, instantaneously, it will re be released. And of course, other other issues that were asked will be subsumed under information security policy and also under risk management under ISO 3100. Uh, thank you. I hope I, I covered or answered. Can I, can I get in here? Thank you, thank you. Uh, let us understand two things. Number one, that uh, we have heard since yesterday that uh, uh, the, the, our actions should be technology neutral. So if we say we, it should be technology neutral and we talk about uh, digital signature, which is PKI driven technology, which doesn't induce a level of technological neutrality into our whole ex exercise. But at the same time, we also should recognize that all those who are sitting here in this room, uh, in 90% of the cases, digital signature is used uh, by us. That is a technology which has been perfected and has induced a level of confidence in us. But at the same time, let us not forget that we should not divorce other technologies which are methods used for authentication, authorization, and other processes. Uh, these are available off the shelf and we should make use of it. Coming to the uh, electronic payment system, that also we should recognize one thing, that when you go to a bank uh, who issues you a check which has written, your, we, your name is written, and if you present that check and you don't sign the check, even if they know that this check leaf has been issued to you, they will not honor that check. But unfortunately, throughout the Asia Pacific, most of the countries, we do a one level or two level of authentication where we only authenticate that the person who is submitting an electronic payment advice is the one who has been authorized to do it. But at the same time, the payment document is not signed. Then also it is honored. And that is the way it is implemented in majority of the countries, including my country also. So I had to go to the, uh, uh, to the, highest bank in our country, which is called Reserve Bank of India, who is Apex Bank, requesting them that, yes, that kind of payment is fine if it is low level payment, but if it is a high value payment, then you should integrate this into the electronic framework of this country for electronic payment, that I should have options to sign this so that tomorrow my banker should not say that you did not authorize for $100 or $1,000, but uh, the payment was done for $10,000. So those kind of uh, uh, aspects should be built into the system and we should insist for it. And I insisted for this in my country. I was holding a position that I could insist and get it vetted by them. So there are order issued that saying that it should be given a, a option to the pay that whether he wants to digitally sign his transaction or only a two factor authentication is good enough to do it. So th these are the pros and cons of doing the things. But I do believe that all the transactions which we are discussing, all Dennis has mentioned today about all documents, you will find that the 80% of this document doesn't need any level of digital signature to be embedded on it. A two level authentication process is good enough to move forward. Only few documents which has financial implications need to be digitally signed. So let us not try to do digital signature affecting on every document which is transacted. 
let us be very careful because it comes with a cost. Thank you. Thank you, Tassin. Um, we are getting close to part two of the session, but just uh, one more question from Zoom. Uh, and uh, may I invite any of our speakers and even Tassin as well uh, to, if you want to reply, just a quick comment. So this question, very simple. Um, many countries have implemented national single windows. Um, so are there any recommended technologies to connect them considering less implementation cost and to cover most of the existing national single windows. Of course, taking note of what Hasin has just mentioned about technology and technology neutrality. So any very quick comments if you have, yeah. Please. So Dennis or the Taksin already take the answer to the proper the answer. So I had just is a so one add the one point. So now is so yesterday or the is a Korea custom service explained about the blockchain based electronic data exchange. So it's the technical trend is moved to the, the using the emerging technology such as the blockchain and the AI or the big data. Why the most organization moved to the, the the advanced technology, the adapting the advanced technology, because to the take care of the reliability, or the data security, or the some kind of the authentication. So, Taksin also already mentioned about the data signature. So, using the data signature or the the data encryption, the protect data the the neutral the the characteristic and the ensure. There is no modification or the, any uh, the attack. But first, first, using the emerging technology, we will uh, provide more the high level security or the reliability. That's why we, the, our the project is to the survey or the, and also the recommend to the using the, the, the introducing the emerging technology to the exchanging within the country or the cross border data the exchange. So I that's why the SCAP also the interesting to the emerging tech, the adapting the emerging technology. So I think so the, the just is the one the what the explanation with the Dennis and the taxi. Um, thank you for the question. I think that the wise is interesting. So let me just share with you, um, since I'm also involved in the, the region as a single window. So I always go for a federated or a distributed approach. That's why I think um, synchronizing or replicating just the reference data, data sets, the key reference data sets of uh, trading partners, wherein if you can really provide an up-to-date in the codifications that you are using, similar to the approach of uh, Korea in, the, in relation to ECO, it's more traditional. And I don't want to say about the blockchain, but I think for me, blockchain is a bit centralized. It's quite difficult to uh, regulate. So that's why if we can just uh, allow the trading partners just to, on a daily basis or maybe every week just to synchronize let's say the importers reference data sets with limited number of data elements just the code the unique reference code the name and also the status whether if you're an aeo just to to go straight uh, without intervention and then the second level i mean you synchronize this on a on maybe end of day business process so that because uh, on our experience in routing some of the electronic messages once the nsw receives it if the importer's code at the exporting country or the export declaration is blank it's quite difficult to route it properly to the actor involved so that when you replicate and synchronize all these reference data sets you will be more comfortable in routing all these cross-border documents when the recipient country or the importing country receives it at the national level, what the Philippines, uh, we will push for this, is to come up with a technological uh, neutral platform. And this is what we call the routing platform. And this is designed more on API. So uh, API bridges and uh, uh, interfaces, wherein it could easily accommodate 
any type of document, whether it's but a, a bilateral exchange, regional exchange, or through FTA exchange. And then um, it should be driven by business rules and information rules. And the other one is we will be pushing for what we call a connector because some border regulatory agencies, they don't want you telling them that you have to um, replace your existing application. Why not just use a connector to directly interface them? And then that connect connector can really transliterate, convert, filter, transform any type of data so that it will be aligned with your existing management portals that you design for each agency involved. So that's my reply to that. Thank you. Um, oh, uh, sorry, do you have anything else there? Do you want to take it on the side? Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Uh, so we're running a bit uh, late on our schedule. So may I pass the session now to part two? Uh, where our moderator is uh, Mr. Sangwon Lim, who is our special UNX advisor. So thank you, Yampai, for kind of introduction. And I would, uh, would be happy to moderate the rest of the one hour because we are a little bit uh, out of schedule, behind schedule. So but we'll try to finish on time. So what I propose is that we have three presenters here, then two commentators and some training sessions, but we have one hour. So maybe three presenters, they try to finish uh, their presentation within 14 to 15 minutes. Then for the commentator together with the uh, Q&A, we can spend an additional 15 minutes, then we would be able to finish within one hour. So uh, for the online participants, in case you wait until we reach it to the uh, Q&A, in case you have any questions come up in your mind while some speakers are presenting, please write on the uh, chatting uh, channels so that the speakers, when they see those comments and questions, they can be prepared to respond to those uh, the queries. So without further ado, let me uh, invite speakers. I think we can go with uh, Dennis, right? Dennis is the first speaker, so Dennis, please. So thank you, Mr. Sangwon. So this next presentation is uh, more on country specific, just for the Philippines. So the output based on the questionnaires that we provided. So I'll just skip this. I think I covered this already earlier. So what is the current landscape? Involvement of the economic operators. Private sector is very crucial. And then the B2B, the business to business exchange, freight papers coming from the carriers from the freight forwarders. Single window platform, I think it's substantial. There's so much um, plus or benefit in using a single window, not necessarily the, the national single window. It could be any similar platforms. And just to give this the key takeaway here is we want to implement what we call the single source of truth principle wherein you can really consolidate everything into one data warehousing. So for risk management, if you want to cover cross-validation, cross-referencing, all the informations, because if you look at all the cross-border documents, let's say the manifest, the commercial document, the packing list, so they use the same documents, requirements of let's say the border regulatory agencies in in the approval of uh, let's say a permit customs also require this as part of the supporting documents but they look at it differently the treatment is different that's why we have to really um, recognize all these differences in their mandates and convert this into business rules or information rules when you get all this uh, commercial uh, cross-border documents and also 
in support of all the interagency national sharing of information. So that single source of data or your big data under data warehousing, you could also use it for crafting economic and fiscal policies. And also in knowing exception management report in the utilization, let's say of certificate of origin under the free trade agreements, are you really benefiting from it when you provide all this preferential rate? And then risk management should no longer be custom centric. We have to encourage also the border regulatory agencies to set up their own targeting and profiling activities. Because if you look at the end-to-end -end cargo clearance process, customs is in the middle. So some of the advanced information or crossword documents, uh, the border regulatory agencies get this advanced information ahead of customs. So if they can provide some sort of uh, exception management report, they could support customs in better designing their risk profiles or their selectivity module. And also, I think it's about time that we also support the BRAGAs because most available tools, reform and modernization guidelines are confined to customs. So much support for the past several years are always for customs. It's about time that we really look at the other participating government agencies and recognize the TRGA's role dynamics and process mandates that affect their ability to cooperate properly in cross-border paperless trade. As mentioned earlier, we have to consider also synchronizing or replicating wherein trading partners that go beyond, it should go beyond setting up just an exchange mechanism of equal importance or formal interoperability, review process of exchange semantics, frequency of re uh, replication algorithms, and also training is also key. So what is the implementation strategy? So, of course, it was formalized with the Bureau of Customs of the Philippines. We got the uh, approval of the commissioner. And then we already provided the questionnaires, the five questionnaires for this uh, five targeted respondents. And we agreed that it should be initiated. This should be driven by the agency, not the, not the consultant. So there should be the one sending this to all the involved actors, the other government agencies. And we agreed with this and collecting data. It's not only from the questionnaires. We can also, we will also do virtual inter interviews, validation sessions, and also desk research. Targeted identification deficiencies. This is the prime intent. And we also con will also consider uh, part participatory and also consultative approach for specific areas that maybe needs clarification. And also recognize the, the readiness assessment that were covered before. So we have to really uh, just pick up some of the key takeaways of that activity and conduct survey with all the five targeted respondents. So the current status, only customs, only customs submitted the completed questionnaire. And um, every, I think in the Philippines during this holiday season, no one works. So that's why we, we expect the completed questions to be submitted sometime in early January. And then as conveyed by customs, uh, possible trading partners are China, Republic of Korea, and also ongoing with the ASEAN member states. So it's very clear in the questionnaire that we're looking at uh, Central Asia, South Asian countries, and also East Timor, but the volume of trading between these countries and the Philippines is quite low. That's why they specified China, 
Republic of Korea and ASEAN member states. So ongoing initiatives, just six, development of the exchange of the ACDD. This is already operational. It was launched the other day and it's all over the news now in the Philippines. And they were also doing technical reference guidelines or data modeling, a higher level data modeling. And this will be um, provided by end of December. And we are also improving, the Philippines improving their electronic certificate of origin system, both for inbound and outbound because uh, they saw really some technical challenges or gaps. And Philippines particip will participate in the exchange of the EFITO certificate. Testing could happen this month or early January. And uh, the target date to exchange the EFITO with some of the ASEAN member states would be sometime in March or April 2023. Information security, as I covered earlier. You have to protect the asset in handling security breaches, et cetera, et cetera. And as presented also by India yesterday, we will also do informed compliance publications. And this will be covered under the website of the NSW and also uh, both for the DA and also customs, just to provide um, case studies, what to do just to help more the trading community. So these are just some of the crossword documents that we are looking at. And, and number one, proposed crossover data exchange. One is the identification or the ID. The value is high. You can use this for the AEO program the integrated risk management. You can use this for advanced ruling. And also this should be signed and discussed under MRA. Legal constraints, minimal, IT implementation, it's simple. And then second is you have the self-certification of origin, although ATIGA or government approved certificate of origin is already in place. They also want something self-certified by the business community. Value is medium, legal constraint minor, IT is medium. Three, export licenses, FITO sanitary certificate. <laughs> FITO, as conveyed earlier, uh, this will be targeted to be on live operation sometime in March or April next year. Value is medium, IT, it's simple. And then uh, we're also, they're also looking at customs inspection um, because uh, this would feed into risk profiling and targeting activities, what we call the 360 degree feedback. So if we can really get the findings based on the inspection coming from the trading partner within the Bureau of Customs in let's say in, in non-intrusive X-ray report, what is the, the findings of the appraiser and examiner through yellow check or red lanes, and also the findings of other border regulatory agencies in relation to pandemic issues, strategic goods, etc. Commercial invoice, this is already in place, wherein before you can, you can lodge an import declaration, you need for particular documents, commercial invoice, um, packing list, performance packing list, and then you have the house BL, master BL, and also the advanced information for the pre-arrival information of the aircraft or the sea carrier, all these things. These are mandatory before you can lodge an import declaration and I think even the manifest. ACDD, export declaration for ASEAN, it's only 15 mandatory data elements, but I think U.S. expressed its interests, interest to exchange the whole export declaration with the Philippines. I think this could be confirmed by our representative from the Philippines. Commercial invoice, packing list as conveyed earlier, and also transport documents. And this one is interesting. Unstructured data or intelligence tips. 
So because we know this is a high level customs to customs maybe information. So sometimes they provide, let's say, because they don't provide really the exact name of, let's say, the carrier, the importer. Sometimes you'll get unstructured data such as uh, we got an information that the a carrier that will arrive from two o'clock to three o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow is carrying this so and so. I mean, strategic goods issue. So, as discussed earlier, since cross border document uh, processing is not static, you have to follow through at the national level. So what we can do, the challenge here is once you receive an unstructured data and intelligence tip, is how to process this further under your data warehousing system in relation to pattern recognition. Two minutes. Trending. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I got... Uh, <laughs> This, I think this is the last one. So transport documents, loading confirmation, just to ensure between the port operators and also another port operator, just to prepare for the arrival of the pallets or the container itself. And then AAO status under MRA, so that you, you, when you receive a particular export declaration, if it's AEO, then definitely it will just be instantaneously released. So that without human intervention, if you automate everything. So these are just the, the current operational systems of customs. I, I don't have to indicate it. The, all these materials will be provided to you. And that ends my presentation. Mr. Sangwan, thank you for reminding me. Okay, thank you very much, Dennis, for wrapping up your uh, presentation within the time frame. So without further ado, let me invite Kerry to intervene. Kerry, please. Good morning again. So I'm, in this time, I will explain the interim results from the observatory study among four countries, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, and Timor Leste. Okay. So firstly, I will uh, explain the content of the feasibility study doing now, so, and then I will explain the way for to finalize this the feasibility study as a conclusion. This slide shows the status of the four countries' trade environment. This status uh, got from national export to, uh, materials from four countries and the output of the questionnaire. Uh, questionnaire. First is the trade environment. The Bangladesh mainly export transport, export and import goods through the maritime transportation. And they said they don't have a transit procedure. However, I think the Bangladesh support transit procedures for neighboring countries such as Nepal and the Bhutan. And Bhutan and Nepal mainly transport, export and import goods through transit procedure through the neighboring countries such as India, China and Bangladesh. Timor Leste transport all export and import goods through the maritime transportation like Bangladesh. This slide shows the, ex the export procedure, including the transit process in case of Bhutan and Nepal. The user submit custom declaration to Ashikuda World with a scan document as attachment. Then custom officer checks the this the application and approves it. When the user receives the approval, user can check it from Ashkuda. However, the user uh, should print out this the permit document on paper. Then the, the user should show the printed doc permission document on the cross border declaration and submit custom declarations for transit to border customs for the example, you know, Indian customs. After transportation within the transit country and arriving at the importing country, the importer submits import declaration to the importing country's custom authority. This slide shows the export procedure in case of Bangladesh and Timor Leste. Almost the same in case of Bhutan and Nepal, except for the transit procedure. Next is 
yeah, next is how to handle custom operations in four countries. Four countries use the, use the ASICUDA world program and they try to upgrade their ASICUDA world program. The ASICUDA world program. For example, Bhutan plans to release a new electronic custom systems in 2023, that means the, uh, next year. This the electronic com, uh, custom system is based on the web environment. Also, four countries complete implementing their national single window and connect with other government agency through their national single window or plan to connect in, in future. As common issues, even though four countries use the, use the ASICODA world program, but for countries still use a paper document and only few, only few electronic documents are used in ASICUDA world and has have the uh, manual process. In general, the ASICUDA world support EDI and IATA XML standard and try to adapt the WCO data model. However, the ASICUDA world over four countries doesn't support the, the WCO data model, which is the customs international standard. Even for countries to complete the implementing their national single window and connecting with the other government agency systems, with their using the, their the national single window, but weak information sharing between government agency systems or government agents and users. This slide shows the list of agencies that conducted surveys to collect information. This agency was selected by discussing with the national expert in a kickoff meeting of, our, of this, this project. This slide shows some issues and requirements based on the based on the output of questionnaire and interviews. Unfortunately, so until now, I just catch up on some issues only from Nepal but I will try to catch up with other three countries after this uh, meeting. So regarding Nepal, there are two representative issues. One is difficult to catch up on what's going on to, uh, during transportation in real time in transit procedure. Second is the long wait time in the border area in transit time. In addition, the major requirement from surveys is that most respondents want to change the custom system to the advanced system and cross-border data exchange as well as the government agency with the country. Fortunately, Nepal government plan to enhance their custom systems. So it is better to find out together how and what to do for the cross-border electronic exchange of trade data. Go back main content of the feasibility study. National experts are filling out of the section two on analysis of the current status with Annex A and B. This slide shows, uh, shows some part of Annex A. Section two is include the trade procedure. So national export load the trade volume of export and import goods trade procedures and describe the workflow using a flow chart. This slide shows the content of section 2.5 ICT infrastructure. So as I already mentioned in part one, the four countries has their custom systems, Ashikuda world, and a national single window. Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal has a separate national single window system, but Timor Leste, Ashikuda world acts as a national single window. Bhutan custom systems is operated by the DOT Department, Department of Trade and the Ministry of Ele uh, Economic Affairs. Nepal is operated by DOC Department, uh, Department of Customs and the Ministry of Industry, Commerce and Supplies. Timor Leste will try to exchange data between eight other government agency and ASICUDA world. Based on deliverables from national export, talking about the, what potential challenges in dealing with the trade business are. 
The potential challenge, uh, challenges include the use of a paper document, manual processing, and low usage of the standard document despite, uh, despite the use of ASHCODA world. There is a weak link, uh, linkage between systems, between government agencies or between users and government agencies. And information sharing is not sufficient between information systems. So we consider what kind of requirement and approaches to achieve them based on these challenges and surveys respond are needed. Despite the era when state of the of the art information technology is applied, many parts still handle the trade and custom operations based on the paper document. There are still many parts that use information technology in limited or partial way. Documenting, re-entering, and duplicating the mission between various stakeholders are not only a risk of only additional time and expense in trade and custom process, but also a risk of human error, counterfeiting, and modulation. Then how to resolve these challenges? It can be achieved through the paperless trade information informa uh, informatization using system processing and electronic documents. And it can be achieved through interoperability, scalability, and reliability by applying international standard in custom areas. In addition, business transparency, accuracy can be secured through information, information applied with emerging technologies. This slide shows what example of developing a proper approach how to resolve a challenge. Regarding the use of a paper document, it is corresponding to address these requirements, interoperability, transparency, reliability, and accuracy. Among requirements, the interoperability can be achieved by, pa uh, by paper trade, standardization, information sharing, and adapting emerging technologies. After defining the, the approaches, list action items, and establish a step-by-step -step implementation roadmap, based on the priority results. Clearly define the goals for each action item and arrange them in consideration of the relationship between the preceding and following action items. This slide shows the step-wide approach for the digitalization of trade part. If, the, if currently you use paper document and trade operations are done by manual processing, it corresponds to the step one. So your effort should be made to reduce the use of a manual and paper document. In other words, uh, electronic documents such as EDI or XML should be introduced for paper trade in trade and standard operations. And information system should be implemented to efficiently process work operations. If trade operations are handled through the electronic document and information system for some task and some functionality bit, uh, has been modernized, semi-automated system can be regarded. It is uh, corresponding to step two. You should make an effort to progress trade procedure automation to reduce trade operation time and cost and increase work efficiency. If trade operation is improved by trade fun functionality modernization or paper transaction in step two, you should provide the diversity of access as the trade environment changes. Step three should provide various access methods such as web and mobile to user. And interconnection for information sharing with the related organizations or the neighboring country. Also, it is efficient to push ahead the national single window and community system for national, internal, uh, national collaborations. Then emerging technologies such as blockchain, big data, artificial intelligence must be introduced to respond to the global supply chain environment by trans, uh, transitioning to a smart grid, a trade and custom system environment. So, for countries that are participating in the feasibility study belong to step one, two, and three, because they already, uh, they have the manual the processing and the use of a paper document. And also they use the ASHCUDA world. 
and also they the, has the national single window. So four countries try to enhance their current status with the emerging technologies and move toward the cross-border paper trade. In, in conclusion, go back to the content of visual research study. So thinking about the consideration for cross-border electronic data exchange of trade data. National export in four countries conducted surveys with Annex A and B and did interviews with their government agencies and filling out the, the draft of Section 2. After reviewing the draft, challenges from the, from the output of the edges analysis will be listed and the draft of Section 3, that is a recommendation, and Section 4, is a, the expected effect, will be prepared. This to be modeled in section three, the describe the current level of the corresponding countries in the paper trade metric level and what to do for the next step regarding the context for undertaking the proposed feasibility study and contains a system customization to provide the detailed analysis of the technical requirements to deliver the proposed solutions. With this, I conclude my presentations. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kerry. Also completing your interventions within the given time frame. So I think this uh, uh, several information contained in your presentation is relevant to the next presentation by Eric because the several countries covered in your study uh, has big uh, trade transactions with India. So let's uh, hear first uh, from Eric from India Customs about the experience, then try to uh, build linkage on how uh, these the South Asian countries can try to uh, build blocks of the data exchange. So uh, Eric from India Customs, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, uh, dear colleagues and friends. So. Uh, I will briefly uh, share uh, some of the experiences that we have in Indian customs in recent times. So uh, taking cue from my previous presentation yesterday, which were primarily domestic reforms and initiatives. So today my presentation is actually going to be on the cross-border aspect of uh, yesterday's base. So it's just a very brief uh, introduction to the kind of pilot projects and implementations that we have so far. Uh, it's the pre-arrival data processing or data exchange that we have initiated in recent times. So this is based on the World Customs Organization concept of a globally networked customs, which uh, actually derives its inspiration from the uh, requirements of the WTO trade agreement, where it is stated that members shall exchange information for purpose of verifying uh, an import or export declarations. So in the customs in the 21st century vision, uh, the globally network, network customs is the first building block and I shall read out the statement. And there is a need for closer real-time collaboration between customs administrations and between customs and business in facilitating legitimate trade and undertaking customs controls. So <clears throat> this is primarily an electronic transmission of selected fields from export declaration as soon as the customs did clearance is allowed by the exporting country. So the importing country will receive these data on an automated environment and it will run the authentication, the genuineness of the declarations which are filed in the importing country vis-a-vis -vis the declarations which have been made from the country of export. So this will greatly help in facilitating trade. Uh, it will allow us to have an efficient risk management system and border tax compliance. I must also inform that we have uh, 13 ongoing and bilateral engagements, uh, although the scope allows for multilateral engagements as well, but in India, it's primarily bilateral. Uh, the similar time, like last uh, this December last year, we already had the a project ongoing with uh, Maldives in December 2021. And I must also inform that we have already taken up engagements with our friends uh, Nepal and Bangladesh. In fact, we have already shared the concept papers as well as the draft memorandum of understandings. So we are very much in touch with them on these aspects. I believe it is relevant for our discussion as well. So, 
as I have already read out in the vision statement, it is primarily customs to customs, but it also allows for customs to business. So as I have informed it as of now, bilateral primarily. So the vision ultimately is to create an international e-customs network, and it will have a set of rules governing the exchange of information between the administration. So all these things will have to be built in the MOU. It will have to be specified. It will have a set of rules on data protection for secure, real-time exchange of customs-related data. So all these requirements will have to be inbuilt into the memorandum of understanding between the engaging parties. So this is a brief uh, a pictorial representation of how actually the process will work. You have the exporter sitting in the exporting country. He makes a declaration in his own country of export. Then it goes to the importing country. So the when the customs declaration are filed, for example, in our country, it'll be the import general manifest followed by the bill of entry. So when the legal documents are submitted to us as per law, then we will verify and, and authenticate those uh, declarations vis-a-vis -vis the declarations which have been given in the country of export. So the modalities I've already discussed a bit. So the data fields are going to be mutually agree agreed upon. So it'll have to be discussed by the legal team and the IT teams. So the indicative list are, for example, the name of the importer, the exporter, the details, the harmonized system nomenclature details up to eight digits perhaps, then the value, the bill of lading, et cetera, and the voyage details, for example, so all these things will have to be mutually agreed and maybe re required to be reproduced in the MOU. So this is the process flow. Uh, you have country A, uh, which is signifying the country of export and country B, which is, if I may use the word, the recipient country, uh, the country which is going to receive the goods. Uh, the country shared the predetermined data fields in an automated environment. Then the second step is the data is processed in the automated custom system. So it can also be verified and amended again, canceled also if required, if there are deficiencies. And when the data is finalized and received, it will be acted upon. It will be acted upon and it will be utilized for uh, me. I mean, like uh, sending out the, what I say, the risk management directions and instructions to the assessing officers for a very efficient clearance process. So <clears throat> it's a two-way two traffic, so it's mutual. So as I have already informed for the sake of repetition, it is expected to lead to enhanced trade facilitation, uh, <clears throat> efficient and verification and monitoring, and better and efficient risk management, better coordinated border management, better tax compliance. So that is primarily about it on the pre-arrival data exchange bit. I, I would also like to briefly inform about the, my colleague from Korea yesterday mentioned about the uh, the electronic transmission of country of origin certificates, which we have recently been engaging with Korea. In fact, uh, in September this year, the heads of customs between Korea and India, we signed the agreement for the technical specification document, the TSD. So we are both now on the phase of the systems development based on the TSD, which has been agreed upon in September. So after this, then we will be starting the testing phase. So we are very much inclined and uh, trying to get it operationalized by June next year. So that is for the country of origin, but apart from this general thing on pre-arrival data processing. So these are the two highlights in respect of cross-border initiatives that we have taken so far. So that is about it from me from my side. Since the time constraints were very short, I was running through. If, if any questions, then I, I can try and answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eric, for your very concise but to the point kind of interventions because your intervention was not too long, but the, the impact was quite big because you elaborated on uh, several important aspects uh, actually carry our original export to emphasize the, uh, the pre-arrival information exchange is very practical and the valuable information exchange item you, you can consider. So with this, I think we can move into some discussions. So let me first invite our two commentators. Maybe I think I can invite Tassim because this the discussion is very relevant to that sub regional block. So Tassim, please. Thank you, uh, Sangwang. First of all, allow me to compliment uh, uh, 
three presenters. Uh, the presentation was very much on uh, to the uh, to the uh, mark and uh, uh, adding input from uh, India makes better sense because uh, the uh, especially the carries. Uh, 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 feasibility study is more dependent on Indian interface because of uh, the two countries being landlocked around India, which is under study. So compliments to all of you to have put in efforts to bring out a framework which really works very well. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, reviewing the uh, documents and I am very confident that uh, my uh, concerns have been integrated and I don't have much to say beyond that. But I have few suggestions uh, as Sangwang has uh, asked for. Uh, though mutual recognition is very much in, uh, in, in the document, but I would uh, argue in favor of uh, adding few things like uh, in carry, you have said many other things on at the national level, but agency level uh, interface building that uh, perhaps uh, lead to be addressed a little more into your framework. And identity management, which we have underlined today is very important in the present context. That also need to be really highlighted into this and while doing the study need to be underlined. Uh, mm, there are few applications which are av available in international domain where enough of standardization has been visited. We have been talking electronic certificate of origin, which is very important uh, document, which for which a lot of this has happened across the globe. So similarly, other documents we should identify and see that whether in the feasibility study that will be low hanging fruit for us to move forward into this one. So maybe there is a project from in UNC fact I mentioned yesterday which basically uh, talks in terms of a blockchain based certificate of origin paper where all standardization has been visited. BRS is already available up for usage by the member states. Maybe we can uh, make take note of it and make use of it so that we don't have to invent the wheel again for that one. Similarly, I would also argue for the benefit of the national consultants, if we can prepare a small paper, which talks in terms of how to fill up these forms, uh, because that's some, some, something which we are discussing here and they need to know better than anyone else. I find a little uh, uh, less uh, discussion on workflow uh, management into the uh, whole supply chain especially take the example of the custodian versus the customs uh, interface. There is not captured in this one. Maybe I would suggest that if that is integrated, then it gives me a feeling that it's not hanging separately, but it's there is a workflow environment that need to be captured that somehow is not captured properly. Somebody says, talks about uh, uh, electronic payment. Uh, my perception about electronic payment is different from someone else's because if if the one bank branch is uh, integrated into the system, it's also an electronic payment. But if all the banks in the country have interchange mechanism for facilitating this, that also is electronic payment. So that is specific specificity should be built into the system that perhaps is uh, miss missing. And I would also argue that uh, data governance part we have discussed a lot is reflected properly into our uh, feasibility study study framework. And transferability of the records, uh, transferability like on MLETR background, that perhaps is not captured properly, that need to be integrated somewhere onto this. And uh, uh, last one, I would suggest that we have uh, 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 done li very little on logistics part of it. The logistics management and the management of uh, route management and uh, trace and track of the cargo in the logistic framework, that perhaps is something which needs to be highlighted. It only talks about the um, payment side or financial aspects of logistics is integrated into this. And I would suggest that if that is done, it will be very uh, well things. Concluding this, uh, 
Carrie, perhaps you may like to see there, there maybe between uh, harmonizing your uh, uh, document with the Dennis. There are some overlap which is existing. Perhaps we can sit together and address it. Thank you very much, uh, Sangwang. Thank you, Tyson. I'm sure that uh, uh, your intervention is quite valuable to Dennis and Kerry in, the, in, in their work to develop and implement this the feasibility framework. So with this, let me now invite Arbin uh, Ma, our longtime friend and expert, regional expert, to share his comment on the uh, presentations. Arbin, please. Thank you, Sangwon. Uh, firstly, uh, congratulations to both Dennis and uh, Kerry for producing this report. Okay, uh, it's very impressive, despite the short time that you were given, right? Uh, for I have nothing too much to touch on on Philippines itself. The things, the thing is that they, um, it was I presume it was a challenge for you to be able to run throughout the entire supply chain to get all the information. Um, well, hopefully for the other countries that's interested to participate, uh, may want to consider the uh, shorter version. We don't have that many. We don't have all Dennis's in every country. Okay, so looking for a consultant to undertake this uh, will be challenging, but uh, it can be in a team. Now, um, this this feasibility study reports by both of you actually is the answer to what I've been asked when I was doing the uh, technical and uh, legal readiness assessment. What's next? Okay, and this is the next. All right, where we actually deep dive down into the areas of information obtained during the technical readiness. Uh, survey, right? And um, touching on that, on the various areas that uh, Kerry has brought up regarding Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, and Timor Leste, right? It's very interesting uh, to see there and then complemented by India, right? All these countries are uh, other than Timor Leste, uh, too far away. Uh, all these countries actually has got a lot of interdependency among themselves. For example, Nepal, uh, their primary seaport is Kolkata. Right, so there is a lot of uh, movement of uh, goods from there, the customs procedures, the transit procedures, and then we're talking about Bhutan. Uh, that is one very unique uh, situation. Like, say, for example, if Bhutan would uh, would to import via uh, Chotogram, that's in Bangladesh. Okay, the goods actually move from one country through India then to Bhutan. So there's double uh, transits there. So maybe uh, some of these projects could be like, say, uh, having a one-stop or a synchronized inspection process or the transit process, rather than going through from Bangladesh to India, to India, to Bhutan. Okay. Uh, similarly, as for um, uh, Nepal, okay, uh, I don't think there's much going through the north sector. Okay. Logistically, it is not so viable. Uh, most of it, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, because I did an assessment many years ago with Nepal. Uh, their primary export routes are through Burgunj in the south of uh, Nepal into India directly. So from there, um, some thoughts could be on the fact that how can we uh, have, since now India has got so many of these uh, initiatives in place, okay, and um, this can also be valuable Okay, to, to have a pilot project of this nature. As for Bangladesh is concerned, right, your primary connection is between Benapal to India on the other side, and that's where they move the goods from uh, through Bangladesh to the northeast of India. So pilot projects are not in the nature between both customs of uh, India and uh, what they call it, um, Bangladesh, will be very valuable to facilitate trade, right? So uh, some thoughts could be put there along those areas. As far as Timor Leste is concerned, now, um, well, Timor Leste is very unique. It's a sea lock country, all right? But the island is divided into two. The east is where you are. The west is Indonesia. So I do believe that you have a lot of transit goods landing in the Palembang port in Indonesia, moving across to Timor Leste. But congratulations on the launching of your new port. Okay, that I think will solve a lot of these uh, 
transit problem. So because your existing port or the old port is very small. Okay. And uh, congratulations on that. So maybe in this study, you could uh, touch a bit of, uh, as far as the table lesson is concerned, could touch a bit more on the new port and how this can improve the facilitation of trade and uh, between um, Timor Leste and the rest of the world. It's in a very valuable position there. And then uh, maybe the study can also uh, include the, the, the exchange of uh, information with Australia, which is um, basically, there's got tons of trade running between uh, Timor Leste and Australia itself. So other than that, uh, since I do understand it's an interim report, so uh, maybe some thoughts could be put into this to complete the whole cycle, right? And uh, like what uh, my esteemed colleague over there, Takshin, has said, there's also other areas to be looked into as well. So for me, I'm a field man. So I look more into the operational field areas that need to be included. Okay? Like, for example, Philippines, you are a sea lock country with multiple transits. How are you going to move goods from one island to the other? Okay. Uh, I think I can conclude my intervention on this. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ivan, for your intervention and sharing your kind of, you know, which experience in helping uh, many countries in moving toward in trade facilitation. So now I think we can move to the Q&A session. So let me first invite to the online participants, whether they have any participants, then I will open the floor to the room. Let me invite the online participants first with, to make sure that they have the chance. So, Pan, do you have any participant from online asking questions other than previously asked? Uh, we have one hand raised from online. Um, Kersan, Shodan, could you... I'm not sure if you allow, could you speak out? Because uh, he or she didn't submit on Q&A box. Please. Oh, okay, Kesang, please, you raise the hand and can you unmute and uh, share your questions or comment? Kesang, can you try to unmute? Or otherwise, another way you can also write down in Q&A or the chat box so that we can see your questions or comment if you cannot uh, unmute yourself. So during this session, you can ask questions to both uh, session one and session two. Hello, we cannot hear you. Well, could you speak louder, please? So we can now hear you. Can you can you speak up? Maybe she, he or she accidentally less. Okay, so may, maybe she has uh, has problem uh, in in with the system. So while she uh, try, let me try to invite other colleagues from the room. So I think a uh, gentleman from Bangladesh uh, wanted to intervene, right? Please. Uh, thank you, dear moderator, for giving me the floor. I feel like uh, having uh, some clarifications on some issues from my Indian customs colleague, Eric. Um, I mean, it is very interesting to know that uh, pre-arrival exchange of customs data they are working with on this point. Uh, but one, uh, some issues that I, 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 I feel like knowing that um, in customs, what happens that, uh, I mean, each and every country is now working with um, WTO TFA uh, agreement. So in that case, under TFA compulsion, we are now implementing a pre-arrival data processing. I mean, business community can now submit uh, documents 
before the arrival of the consignments at the port area premises. So in that case, I mean, what kind of customs data, uh, pre-arrival customs data will be shared? That is one point I want to know uh, in that respect. And um, is there any kind of, are there any kind of modalities they have set up uh, for the interchange of the or exchanging of data among the countries that uh, Eric has mentioned? This two point I want to know. Okay, thank you, Bangladesh. So let me give the floor to Eric to respond. Yeah, uh, hi, thank you. So uh, in, in March uh, this year, uh, we had a 13 joint group of customs meeting where we had these uh, discussions on uh, automated exchange of pre-arrival customs data with uh, Bangladesh. So the specifications as regard to what would be the data, data fields are contained in the documents that we have shared across, which I mm, would not be sharing here. So uh, that I believe we can discuss further, but officially from our side, we have already shared across to Bangladesh, but primarily it's more or less the same thing which I have uh, shown in the slide before us. So. It will, the illustrative fields, the kind of requirements on both sides, uh, generally, those I have already shared there. So if there are any further very specific information that my colleague would like to know, we, we can share mutually between ourselves, which I am afraid I would not be in a position to share before this gathering. Thank you. Okay, so I recommend to colleagues bilaterally, maybe during the lunch time, to share the details, maybe because Indian customs are not in a position to share the data element at this point with all the participants. So I just suggest to, to bilaterally engage for the details. Is it okay? okay. Oh, you, you have a more. Uh, I, I, I have uh, some points, uh, I mean, to know from Kerry. Uh, she has made a wonderful presentation on, on I mean, um, uh, case studies and lessons for the implementation of cross-border paper estate projects. I mean, Bangladesh is also a part of this uh, uh, study. And she has mentioned that uh, there are no transits, I mean, under, under Bangladesh head. I mean, have you uh, only uh, considered here a land transit? I mean, uh, for this study, because uh, between Bangladesh and India, there has been river and transit since 1972 uh, through a protocol named PIWTTA, Protocol on uh, Inland Water Transit and Trade. Uh, I mean, full meaning is this. It has been in place since 1972, and there are 10 protocol routes through which goods are transited between Bangladesh and India. And another improvement there is that, I mean, since 2015, uh, Bangladesh has allowed India to use our Ashugonzo River and Port to transit goods through landway as well through Akhaura to Tripura. So in that case, I mean, it covers around 55 kilometers land area as well. So I mean, both river and, and land transit there is. And another improvement we have had that, I mean, in 2018, in October, Bangladesh and India signed an agreement on the use of Chattagam and our Mongla port by which India will be able to use our Chittagong and Mongla port and to carry goods from Bangladesh to its Northeastern India. And we have completed already four trial runs under that agreement. And we are now going to issue uh, a permanent order uh, how goods will be carried I mean, or transited uh, from India through Bangladesh to India and Northeastern region. So these are the some developments I mean, have probably you can also consider uh, for this item. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the, you have the proper info, info, uh, information. So. Okay, just I th just uh, received some materials from Bangladesh National Export, but I also uh, double check again the, your the explanation. So you mentioned means to the transit procedure between Bangladesh and India. Also, another development is that we are going to sign a transit agreement with Bhutan as well. Ah, Bhutan and is Bhutan, also well. uh, and it is in process and it will be signed very shortly. Ah, okay, so 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 I already uh, explained about that. I think I assume the Bangladesh also support transit procedure with the uh, supporting to the other country. So I would uh, check again to the land and the, the waterway transportations. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So let me give the floor to Rama. Rama wanted to intervene, right? Uh, yes. Um, actually, I have a question to either Kerry or to Ari. Um. Uh, from my understanding, there are a number of the uh, like uh, treaty regarding the transit in Sussex area. 
like uh, I just checked from him the uh, internet that the, like, in year 2020, the Nepal and India signed the uh, amended the uh, bilateral transit treaty. Uh, in this kind of the uh, um, transit treaty, I'd like to know whether there are any kind of the uh, arrangement to utilize um, the electronic means to facilitate the uh, transit procedures. Uh, from my experience in other countries, in other uh, economic regions, sub-regions, um, in their uh, transit treaty, they mentioned about utilizing the online tool uh, among the parties, especially customs, uh, to facilitate the, 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 the movement of the goods, like uh, uh, exchanging the, the the transit information between the customs and that kind of thing. So I'd like to know whether there are any kind of the arrangements is there already or is there any ongoing discussions? Otherwise, I'd like to request the uh, ASCA whether ASCA can design some kind of the model, um, the uh, model, the treaty, transit treaty, how this uh, online tool can facilitate this uh, transit, uh, the, the treaties. Thank you. So thanks, Lama. But it's so uh, unfortunately I didn't catch up that kind of information from the four countries. So I will check again the four countries uh, national expert and also the the yesterday and today the presentation from India Customs. The India already the starting to the mutual agreement between the Bhutan and Nepal. So I will the send email to check about the, this the mutual agreement about the pre arrival information or uh, information ex uh, exchange. So, but I'm not sure. But this uh, I will the double double check. But until now on, I didn't catch up the, any information about the transit treaty regarding the online some kind of platform or something like that. Okay, thank you. I think yes, uh, Rama, thank you for raising this the valuable point. I think it's more relevant to Yan and Tengfei. They are not here somehow. So but uh, I would like to uh, young fight to remind them basically that the uh, if some countries uh, of the ASCOM member states they have some transit or trade uh, uh, treaties and uh, if they are joining CPTA, uh, CPTA can be a kind of you know bridge to link those uh, treaties that does not have the paper trade implementation, and uh, CPTA can be utilized to enhance their existing transit or trade treaties by adding just you know simple uh, one sentence in the existing transit treaty for the transit procedure. Uh, CPTA can support uh, the paper's way, something like that. That would be, I think, a valuable point that the ESCA member state can consider together with the uh, ESCA secretariat. Of course, in the afternoon, the parties of the framework agreement would uh, discuss about the action plan, and there is some linkage that uh, the secretariat and parties can take note of. So with this, uh, anyone else from the room would like to make any comments or questions? Okay, if not, let me go back to the online again, whether there is any additional questions or comment or the previous the participants would like to intervene again. Ban, is there any update? No, ha. Okay, if not, then we are exactly on time. So we are finishing at 11.30. Uh, before we close, let me pass the floor to, back to Yon Fai for housekeeping announcement for uh, remaining part and the afternoon, please. Thank you, Sangwon. Um, so we will now break for lunch. And just like yesterday, we have light lunch refreshments over there. Um, I understand that the menu is supposed to be different every day. So I'm looking forward to something else other than the sandwich from yesterday. Um, and we will resume at 1 p.m. for agenda item two of the standing committee in the same room later on. So we'll see you later. Thank you. <laughs>